You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. I feel like who art ed? Try to spice it. Who art ed? Mr. Wood <laughs> art ed me. Yeah. Either way, it, it's ambiguous. It works on so many levels. I know. I thought it was a great start. Welcome to Who Arted, where we explore visual arts in an audio medium. I'm your host, Kyle Wood, and today we're going to be looking at Merritt Oppenheim and her most famous work, Object, sometimes referred to as Luncheon in Fur or Breakfast in Fur. It's the teacup wrapped in fur from 1936. Interestingly, this piece came out of a joke between Merritt Oppenheim and Pablo Picasso as they were sitting in a cafe in 1936, but it went on to become considered one of the greatest surrealist sculptures of all time. It was actually the first surrealist piece acquired by the Museum of Modern Art in New York. But before we get into all of that, I want to talk a little bit about Merritt Oppenheim, the woman behind the work. Oppenheim was born October 6th, 1913 in Berlin. She was named after a kid from a popular novel back then. Uh, Meritlin was the character in the book. And basically, Meritlin was sort of a wild child living in the woods. Seems like an apt name for Merit Oppenheim, as she was a young woman and an artist who blazed her own trail, as we'll see. In 1914, her father, a doctor, served in World War I. Merritt's mother took the kids to live in Switzerland with her parents. And it was in Switzerland that Oppenheim was exposed to a lot of art. Her family seemed to appreciate the modern art movements in particular, and Merritt was interested in expressionism, cubism, fauvism, really all the best isms of the early 20th century. Now, as a doctor, her father would keep up with the latest research, cutting-edge ideas, including the works of Carl Jung. He was a popular psychiatrist doing innovative research. He was a protege of Sigmund Freud, but while Freud was focused on sort of the personal unconscious and the subconscious, my understanding is Carl Jung was a little bit more interested in an idea of a collective unconscious, some commonality amongst all humans and the unconscious mind and archetypes and all of that sort of stuff. After reading the work of Jung, Merritt's father encouraged her to start recording her dreams in 1928, and she would continue to write in detail and analyze her dreams throughout the rest of her life. But in her early adulthood, at just the age of 18, those dreams involved art. And so in 1932, she moved to Paris to study art, specifically painting. And within just a year, she was getting a big break. She was hanging out at a lot of the cafes that artists were known to frequent. And she met artists like Hans Arp and Alberto Giacometti. They visited her studio, and they liked what they saw, so they invited her to participate in a surrealist show. From there, she met and started to befriend a number of big-name artists like Man Ray, Marcel Duchamp, Max Ernst, André Breton. It was the association with Pablo Picasso, though, that seems to have been the real turning point in her life and her career. So in 1936... She was making inroads in the arts, but she was still kind of in that phase where she had to have a day job. And that day job often included sort of assisting, making um, jewelry and other things like that, sort of functional pieces. One day, she goes to a cafe, and she's meeting with Pablo Picasso and Dora Mar. Now, Longtime listeners, I'm sure, are familiar to some extent with Pablo Picasso. I've made a couple of episodes about him and more to come. Dora Mar was a photographer, a poet, a painter, and she was also romantically involved with Picasso at that time. So they're sitting, they're having lunch, and Picasso notices that Merritt Oppenheim is wearing a fur-lined bracelet that she had made. And he comments on how Basically, anything can be covered in fur. Merritt Oppenheim was known for her quick wit, and she replies, saying, even her cup and saucer could be covered in fur. 
And then, in a joke that must have been hilarious to her but confusing to the wait staff, she just pushes it further, yelling, waiter, a little bit more fur. Now, apparently, Merritt Oppenheim was the type of person who had no concept of taking an at-best mediocre joke way too far. So she ran with it, and after that luncheon, she goes to a department store, and she buys a teacup and saucer. And she also bought some Chinese gazelle fur, and she carefully and meticulously lined the teacup and saucer and spoon with the fur of that gazelle. Now, I think as we learn about art history, it's easy to look at a piece like this that started off as a joke and think how absurd the art world is that this would come to be one of the definitive pieces of a surrealist movement and that it would hold a place in one of the most esteemed museums in the United States. But I think what that interpretation is missing is that what separates a simple joke from a piece that starts as a joke and becomes significant is the execution. Merritt Oppenheim was very careful and deliberate in her construction of the piece. As she wrapped the teacup in fur, she chose different segments to orient the the strands, the hairs of the fur, in different directions for different sections. The color also shifts, so it looks and feels different inside the cup versus the outside. And while the inspiration may have been something uttered frivolously, the work was serious. Just as the Surrealists would give credence and give weight to the interpretation of dreams, they, they would explore free associations and the ideas and connections that can be produced spontaneously. And so a joke seems like the perfect foundation to build off of as she just spontaneously replied to what another artist had put out there. It's that improvisational technique that can lead to brilliance. The, there's that old saying that creativity is allowing yourself to make mistakes, but art is knowing which ones to keep. Throughout that day and every day, I'm sure Merritt tossed off all sorts of jokes, but she recognized that this was one worth keeping. So I think it's important to look at why is this one worth keeping? I think it's because there's this visceral sort of tension underlying the piece. And I'm not talking about the tension that was created between a customer and a waiter as she went off menu and requested something that the the staff could not supply. I think it's because as we look at it, the fur and the teacup and saucer, all of those things are signifiers of wealth and status and privilege. They're sort of luxurious items. They're soft and delicate. And yet when you put them together, they become sort of repulsive. I mean, I can't help but think about what would it be like to sip from that teacup and taste the hairs of an animal. Ugh. She built off the ideas of others like Marcel Duchamp, who had been a pioneer introducing the concept of um, the ready-made and using found objects for sculptures. And she's recontextualizing these, these familiar objects. You know, we've seen fur, we've seen teacups, uh, but when you put them together, the meaning completely transforms. And there's something just brilliant about the way that she took these functional objects she purchased from a department store and turned them into something that is no longer functional. It is now a symbol. It becomes almost a Rorschach test or those inkblot tests for the viewer to look at and create these new associations and a new meaning. And I think that's why it's lived on so long. Because it's no longer just an object that can hold tea. It holds a place in people's imaginations. Now, if you want to learn more about Merritt Oppenheim, Surrealism, or other artists like Marcel Duchamp, be sure to check the show notes because I'll be putting in links to other relevant episodes. 
This concludes this week's episode of Who Arted, part of the Airwave Media Podcast Network. If you found this tolerable, please leave a rating or review on your favorite podcast app. You can find images of the work being discussed this week and every week on social media at Who Arted Podcast on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. And of course, on the website, whoartedpodcast.com. Podcast done.